तो वहां वेलकम लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वंस मोर टू आवर थर्ड वेबिनार ऑफ अ सीरीज ऑफ फोर विद द टॉपिक of human fraternity in this week of human fraternity here at the inter uh, at the institute for interreligious dialogue and islamic studies in nairobi my name is matthias eda i work here as advisor for interreligious dialogue i'm being seconded by a german uh, organization called agia mondo as part of the civil peace service program of the german government um in that function i support the missionaries of africa or the white fathers in building their J'ai bien reçu le J'ai bien reçu le PowerPoint. Robert, je pense qu'on est je pense qu'on est en direct là Robert. D'accord. very sorry i think my connection okay. is a bit unreliable can you hear me now again yes 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 we can hear you matthias okay let me quickly very quickly before we close again i'll introduce uh, sheikh abu hamsa um so that he can start um sheikh abu hamsa has been working with us for quite a while um he is an imam in the jeda mosque in kibera here in nairobi He has been trained by Al Azhar University in Cairo. He holds a bachelor's degree in conflict resolution and peace building, and he's the director of religious affairs at the Supreme Council of Kenya Muslims in Nairobi. He lectures at Jeddah Mosque and is a regular panelist on Muslim issues on different radio stations. He also sits on the National Muslim Church Committee. Sheikh Abu Hamza is a known peace builder in Kenya. and he has um um volunteered uh, to talk about the muslim perspective on the declaration of human fraternity the so called abu dhabi declaration between pope francis and the grand imam of al azhar so yet the floor is yours sheik always welcome thank you thank you very much uh, my brother matthias and uh, thank you also all those who are listening and uh, following with us the topic of discussion today it's uh, is one of the most important uh, topics and works uh, that the faith community has found itself in it uh, pope francis and uh, grand imam of al azhar coming together uh for the historic abu dhabi declaration uh which aims at bringing peace uh in the world amongst the people of different religions i think this is uh, uh one of the historic events that will be held throughout and uh for a very long time uh, will remain in the history of muslims and christians just to give uh, a brief background is that uh while pope francis is the head of the catholic fraternity uh, in the world uh al imam or the grand imam as uh, he's commonly known dr ahmad atayeb 
is the head or he leads Al Azhar uh, University. Al Azhar University is an authority within the Islamic jurisprudence. It's one of the most respected institutions in the Islamic world and is one of the oldest uh, educational institutions that have produced so many scholars going back uh, some centuries back, even in the lives uh, of those who came so many years before us, as early as 14th and 15th century. Uh, Al-Azhar University for quite some time uh, has been very much inclined towards the doctrine of Wasatiya uh, or the middle path as it's commonly known because Al-Azhar believes in humanity and he believes that all people irrespective of their religious uh, uh, backgrounds can still live together and can also dialogue together, just as it is in the teachings of Islam. So when Grand Imam Ahmed al Tayyib and uh, Pope Francis uh, do the declaration in Abu Dhabi uh, in the meeting that they did, this is purely uh, for promotion of peace in the world and also for ensuring that people live together uh, irrespective of the differences of religion. Uh, allow me to mention at least two things uh, that we can say the document is about. The declaration of the Dhabi. First, we say it's a document on human fraternity. It's a document that uh, looks in to the concept of humanity. Uh, as is mentioned in the Quran, uh, God says in the Quran that we've created you as humans, we've created you, all, all, all these beings, from one father and one mother, that is from Adam and Eve. And in this aspect of humanity, this is what we say that the document first is about uh, human fraternity, because it connects us all as one. Secondly, also, uh, we can say it's an agreement or the document uh, is an agreement to help bring an end to conflict and uh, also help fight extremism. Uh, we know that as religious people or, or religion uh, itself is sometimes misused by the people of religion. We've had so many conflicts that has been sparked by religion uh, and not withstanding also the extremist positions that we've had, the problem that have caused, uh, was caused by extremism in the world. And so this document also helps uh, in bringing this agreement, uh, it helps in ending such a conflict that emanates from religion, from our positions as religion, because in Islam, the teaching is strictly uh, said that you have your religion and I have my religion. This is what the God says in the Quran. And that the basics of that teaching is that you cannot force somebody to follow your religion or you cannot also uh, use force to make somebody become part of your religion. But what it says is that you have to respect the other. Everybody has his religion. So in that manner, you respect his religion. At the time of revelation, of uh, this verse which says you have religion and we have our religion, Prophet Muhammad, peace uh, and blessings of Allah be upon him, was being taunted every time by the uh, idolatries. Every time they would come to him and tell him that we want you to worship our, our, our religion or our gods, and at the same time in turn, we will also worship your God. So God revealed to him that you tell them, you have your religion and we have our religion. The only thing between us will be that we will respect everyone's religion. Whatever you worship, because at that time, those people were worshiping rocks and stones, but the prophet was told to tell them in a dignified manner, 
and in a honest manner that whatever you worship, we will respect, but you also respect us in what we worship. And that was the meaning of that verse. So right now, when we have this declaration, that is the Abu Dhabi, the human fraternity, we say that it is supposed to help bring an end to conflicts that sometimes ask people of religion, because we know we are fanatics. Everybody loves his religion very much. And sometimes that causes fanatism. And being that, uh, because of that, uh, you tend to defend so much what is in your religion and you blind yourself to what the other religion is about. The, teach, the good teachings of the other religion. When we come together as people of faith, we normally look at what are the connections. Because all the religions, uh, whether Islamic, whether Christianity, whether Judaism or Hinduism, they all have one common aspect, and that is good moral values that are found in all these religions. And these are the commonalities that when we are speaking about coming together as people of different faith, we are trying to look at these commonalities that bind us together. Every religion teaches about love. Every religion uh, teaches about uh, good moral values. Every uh, religion teaches about uh, respect. So it is those that we need to expose and work on it, such agreement and bringing exposure into this and also trying to enforce the values that are found in each of our religion. Uh, the Wasatia concept or the middle path concept that uh, Al-Azhar encourages is more about moderation. It's more about tolerance and it's more about rejection of radical extremism. Moderation means that you can and you will work with any other person in a moderate way. Respecting, tolerating, encouraging, and also understanding the other. The notion of the other is actually what brings conflict so many times. Once we treat ourselves as others, ourselves and others, meaning that we have those who are not from amongst us, those who are not like us, those who are others from us, that notion itself uh, brings about extreme thoughts. And this is what moderation uh, or the wasatiya concept that allows her and uh, uh, the Grand Imam Ahmed Tayyib has for so many years uh, been preaching, encouraging, and also in all, uh, all his sermons, uh, taking that route. And the same thing we can see also in uh, uh, Pope Francis, that he is also encouraging moderation, he's also encouraging tolerance, and mostly uh, uh, the declaration was a rejection of radical extremism. This is found mostly with us within our religions. This is mostly with us as religious leaders. Sometimes when we preach, sometimes when we teach, sometimes we tend to be extremists in what we tell our people. Coming to the concept itself and the declaration. First of all, this calls for protection of the minorities. Sometimes people found themselves in the minority position, like the Muslims in the Western world, like the Christians in the Middle East, and in many other places that we have the minorities who are of different uh, religious faith or understanding. This document calls for protection of the minority from sometimes extremist or extremism emanating from the majority syndrome, and even sometimes protection of the minority, either of their rights, 
to build churches, to build mosques, or also to be heard. Just because they are minority, when we speak in terms of religious values and in terms of religious doctrines, we say that we let them be. And this is what the document is about. It also calls for the total rejection of the use of religion in justifying hatred and violence. We know that this is the gist of the problems that we have in the world. A lot of hatred and a lot of violence can also be seen and heard all over the world and it's all in the name of religion. When we speak about the extremists in both religions, Muslims and Christians, and especially uh, within us or among us, the Muslims, the extremists or those who justify killings, they use the name of religion. Either advancing an ideology that to them is based on religion, either misinterpreting the teachings of the religion, for example, in our case like Muslims, the concept of jihad, have seen uh, a lot of young people lured, and in most cases, even losing their lives in the belief that they are in the course of religion. So when we call for rejection of a, a justification of hatred, that you hate the other, that you hate the religion that he is, that you hate him because he belongs, he's based on the other religion, uh, and also you justify the cause of violence against these people. Uh, we've seen so many uh, killings, we've seen so many uh, murders, and we've seen so many uh, maimings in the world just in the name of religion. Like I said, no religion in the world uh, teaches anything that is bad because all religions abhor good values, the values of love, uh, the values of, of uh, good neighborliness, uh, tolerance. Every good value that is found in Islam is also found in any other religion. What this document or whatever the declaration is, is not new. It is something that has happened uh, before. For us Muslims, for example, I can quote an example, the early times of Islam in Medina. Islam showed itself at that time uh, to be tolerant towards many other uh, uh, local rituals and practices that were found at that time. At that time, it allowed for a greater acceptability of whatever the others were doing at that time. When the Prophet wasallam went to Medina, for example, people of Medina were not Muslims. There were Jews or the Jews in Medina, there were the idol worshippers of all, and they were also tribalists. Of all these people, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not ignore the existence of all this, but instead adopted and also made peace with all those that he found in Medina. Uh, the famous Medina constitution or the Medina declaration uh, that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam signed with the people of Medina. In as much as uh, he was the leader of Muslims and Islam at that time and also the prophet, but he also reduced himself into the person who negotiated the passage of this document as a way of how people would be living in Medina. And that became the constitution 
of people of Medina, how they would live together. From the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there have been instances of encounter between Muslims and people of other religions. And that encounter of the Prophet, uh, uh, and that uh, history of the Prophet provided the platform for Muslims to dialogue uh, with any other person of any other religion. Because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did so in that uh, formation of the Medina constitution. In the cost context of that Medina constitution, uh, early Muslims had directly negotiated for the public space that was found in Medina. The Jews were allowed their space and also to practice their religion. The Muslims were allowed their space and also to practice their religion. And so were the others. And there was also a clear cut, uh, 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 adopted way of how people would behave within the community. And anyone who at that time would go against would also be dealt with in a manner and in a way that is prescribed in that constitution. So uh, as Muslims, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we saw also during uh, the early conquest uh, of lands that were surrounding the Arabian Peninsula, Sayyidina Umar, the second caliph of Islam, also signed a treaty with non-Muslims uh, from as far as Jerusalem. At that time, uh, they were called the people of uh, Isla. He signed with them. He assured them of the Muslim protection at the time of conquest. Whenever Muslims could conquer their land, he would sign with them uh, agreements to assure them of their protect protection. It is even said that uh, uh, when Prophet Umar anhu, entered the city, of Jerusalem to receive the keys. We are also told in history that he refused to pray in a church for the reason that he feared for the future Muslim generation of that place at that time uh, in that uh, it would be an excuse for the Muslims later on to confiscate the church from the Christians under the pretext that uh, uh, the land was now under the Muslim rule. So for that matter, uh, Sayyidina Umar refused to pray in the church for protection of the church so that Muslims would not in future uh, or in other times after him, so that Muslims would not take over the church. Also, we have several examples that exist after that. Uh, besides Sayyidina Umar and uh, Prophet Muhammad, we also have other examples within the Islamic history that happened. Uh, for example, uh, Muslims engaged with people of other religions uh, with an attitude of tolerance. In Andalusia, where we had uh, the Muslim ruler, Abdul Aziz bin Musa, who was the commander of the Muslim armies in Andalusia at the time, at the time that the Muslims conquered that area, he assured the Spanish ruler of that time, uh, Theodomiro, that as long as he respected agreements that they had between them, uh, mutual understanding, tolerance, and living together, that as, as long as he respected that agreement that he signed with him, the Muslims or the Christians in that place were to have the protection of the Muslims at that time. It was just an example of another agreement or another a declaration that was done at that time. We also have in the Islamic history also during the time of uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, what we call Daulatul Uthmaniya, uh, when the empire, when the Ottomans were ruling, one of the empire, uh, Mahmud II, 
Mahmoud II declared that, and I would like to quote what he said, I differentiate the Muslims from among my subjects in the mosque, the Christians in the church and the Jews in the synagogue. I do not see the slightest difference between them. I love all of them and I treat them with justice. All of them are truly my children. This is what uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire, the ruler Mahmoud II declared. So, and in that declaration, he made a pact that all the Muslims that were under him at the time, uh, the Jews, and also uh, the Christians at that time, he made sure that all of them uh, were one. All of them became uh, of the same. He treated them equally. He allowed uh, the churches. He allowed the synagogue also uh, from the Jews. And that is how some of the, treat uh, the treaties that were done in the Islamic world. So speaking of Islam, Islam encourages uh, people to dialogue, just like Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. He dialogues so much. We have history of so many letters that he wrote, uh, more than 15, uh, more than 10 letters that he wrote to different uh, rulers, kings, and people of different religions. All this he did in terms of respect. He wrote to the king of Ethiopia at that time, uh, Nagash, King Nagash is not a Muslim, but he also sent Muslims to him for protection when there was persecution in Mecca. And it was in that uh, delegation that he sent and what they told Nagash, that Nagash became so friendly to Muslims, even if at that time he was not a Muslim, but he supported uh, the Muslims who were sent there against their persecutions. And he allowed them to stay in his kingdom in as much as they liked, and they did stay for so long at that time. Prophet Muhammad also, we know that at that time, he also sent and wrote, uh, wrote and sent a delegation uh, to the king of Egypt at that time, who was not a Muslim also. And uh, the Copt king at that time in return, while returning the Prophet Muhammad uh, a message of peace, he also sent him uh, some gifts. Among the gifts that he sent him, he sent Prophet Muhammad uh, Honey. He sent Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, two slave girls. He sent him a camel and he sent him a doctor. All these five were sent to Prophet Muhammad from the Coptic king uh, from Egypt as a, go, as a sign of good gesture of the peace message that the Prophet wasallam had written to him. Uh, but the Prophet, in his wisdom, returned all but three. Uh, he returned the doctor uh, saying that he did not need a doctor because he made a declaration and that is the famous saying of the Prophet وسلم, that uh, we Muslims, we eat only uh, uh, when we're hungry and when we're hungry, uh, when we eat, we don't eat uh, to completely fill our stomach, but we, we eat leaving spaces for air and also spaces uh, for water. So this will help us not to get sick every time. And as such, we do not get sick uh, quite often. And for this, he returned the doctor saying we don't need a doctor. He also, uh, he took the camel saying this will help us in transport. He also took honey saying that this will help us to cure. He also took the two slave girls, uh, one was the mother of his child, one became the mother of his child, and the other, uh, he gifted his best friend. So we can see that these are all this, this gifts and all these good gestures were part of Prophet Muhammad's uh, peace messages that he had sent uh, to the kings and the people who are of different religion. He very much respected them and he very much made peace with them. Uh, at that time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the people of Makkah, where he was born, 
the differences that arose between him and them was about the message of Islam that he had. But still again, he also made some other declarations and uh, peace messages with them. Irrespective of how they treated him, but he still could be seen going into treaty, so many treaties with them, and one of the treaty was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, as it, as it was known in the Islamic history, uh, it was a skewed treaty in which Muslims were not to be allowed to enter uh, Mecca, but non-Muslims would be allowed to enter Medina. Uh, Muslims were not allowed, uh, any one of them who would enter Mecca or who would uh, 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 go to Mecca would not be returned, but any non-Muslim who would come to Medina would be returned. Uh, it was skewed in such a way that they also told the prophet at that time that they did not recognize his prophethood. They did not recognize him as a prophet. And uh, it brought a lot of argument uh, about the letter of the prophet to them during the signing of that treaty of Hudaybiyah. Uh, they even told Prophet Muhammad not to use the title prophet of Islam. He should just address himself as Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, and not Muhammad, uh, the prophet of Islam. For so many Muslims at that time, uh, it was very difficult to comprehend, given that these people did not accept uh, to call Prophet Muhammad or did, did not accept his prophethood, and they still demeaned himself uh, by looking at him as an ordinary person and rather not addressing himself as the prophet or the leader of Muslims at that time. But also in uh, because of tolerance, because of uh, the peace that he had, and because he was so much inclined towards this declaration, he allowed all that. He told his uh, chief advisor and chief negotiator, who was Ali, he told Ali, accept and just write, that this declaration is from Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, and not Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. Too much uh, anger and too much dislike of some Muslims, just like I say, sometimes uh, religion brings about fanatism, and then at that time I can call those Sahabas fanatics of the prophet. And they wanted to go to the extreme telling the prophet that we should not accept this, uh, to sign this declaration or to sign this treaty because it's skewed, it's one-sided. They, they do not even want to recognize you as prophet. They want to be you to write just Muhammad, the son of Abdullah and uh, such alike. But the prophet told them that for the sake of peace and for the sake of this declaration, declaration we would accept whatever terms they say, we will accept. And that is how he told them bring the paper, I pen my signature into it. And actually Prophet penned his signature in that historic uh, declaration that became so famous to be known as the Declaration of Hudaybiyah, that there will be no war between the two sides, between the Muslims and the non-Muslims, there'll be no war, and that uh, uh, any Muslim who would defect would, be would not be returned, but any non-Muslim who would uh, defect would be returned. In as much as it was killed, the prophet allowed, and it continued and it stayed for quite some time, for nearly one and a half or two years. Now, given all this history, we can now see that from where we come from and from where we are, the history of dialogue in terms of uh, religion has been there. It is up to us religious leaders and people of religion to up or to continue uh, what the prophet and what the other religious leaders did at that time. We are followers of our fathers. We are followers of the eminent scholars of religion. It's up to us to uh, stick to that. Whatever this declaration was done, uh, the Abu Dhabi Declaration, as it's now famous for, uh, famously known, looks at the human fraternity that we need to tolerate each other. 
we need to appreciate uh, each other and also that we need to differentiate between the religious politics, the ethnic lines, and also what is it that values we need to put as human fraternity. Dialoguing is one of the good ways, and it has always worked within the religious, as I've put in the history, as we've seen in the Prophet Muhammad, as we've also seen in other uh, 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 leaders who came after him among the Khalifas uh, of Islam, like the Khalifa Abu Bakr also, did a lot of declarations and dialogues uh, uh, with people who were different, including uh, the Muslims who had different views from him. Uh, one of the problems that we have faced in our contemporary times is the issue of tolerance, even amongst us uh, who are uh, of the same. For example, amongst us Muslims, we have also not found space to dialogue amongst ourselves. Uh, the Shia Muslims, uh, the Sunni Muslims, and then the Sunni Muslims, uh, 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 the, the Salafis or the, Wahhab, the Wahhabis among us Muslims, and uh, the, 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 the Tariqa Muslims, the non Wahhabis among them. Yes. As I continue, sorry for the uh, hiccup. I think uh, electricity have gone off on my side here. Hello, Matthias, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yes, sorry. For the hiccup on my side, uh, the electricity had uh, gone. Uh, in conclusion, what I'm saying is that dialogue is very important. And uh, uh, we have not, as Muslims, I was giving us an example that we have not uh, find it amongst ourselves also that uh, we can sit together and dialogue as Muslims uh, uh, of uh, different uh, religious views, uh, the Sunnis, uh, the Shias, uh, and also uh, the Salafis amongst us, uh, we all uh, confess to the same religion that is Islam, but at the same time, uh, from our uh, differences, we have not find time uh, to dialogue together. Uh, the same applies to uh, the Christians also, uh, perhaps the Catholics, perhaps the Protestants, perhaps because everybody has a space and everybody feels that uh, uh, he's closed in his space. I think uh, what this declaration uh, therefore means to us is that uh, we can also encourage dialogue, dialogue from within uh, the intra, uh, both intra and inter uh, religious uh, spaces that we have, uh, that we can still command dialogue and still talk together and also uh, 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 make our people understand the diff there's so many differences that we have can all also be the so, the so many opportunities uh, that we can also have 
uh, to be one. Uh, because when we dialogue as the prophet taught us, and as we have seen from him, when we dialogue, uh, then the humanity wins. And this is actually uh, the concept of all this, uh, what has happened in this declaration. And uh, as to conclude, I can say thank you very much uh, for being with me. With me. Uh, thank you very much for also uh, giving me an audience and may God bless all of us. Thank you. Shukran Jazilan, ya Sheikh. Thank you. Nah, shukru, shukru lillah. Alhamdulillah, shukran. Back to you, Matthias. Matthias is not here. <laughs> okay. Do we have any uh, questions or input or uh, any questions from what I've uh, spoken so that we can also... Uh, could, you, could you give us some example of uh, uh, dialogue in Kenya between... Uh, you and Christian leaders and how our people uh, uh, see this in your mosques, because we have the same, uh, we, we are and get involved in the same things in, in France, in same meetings and uh, with our colleagues, uh, Imams. And it would be very interesting to know what you do in uh, Nairobi. Uh Thank you very much. Yes, in Kenya, we have uh, uh, two types of dialogues and uh, uh, one is structured and one is not structured. Uh, for the unstructured uh, discussion or dialogues, we normally have within uh, uh, communities because as you know, uh, many or uh, a lot of uh, Muslims in Kenya uh, came from different communities, which also have a lot of non-Muslims. We have uh, a, a kind of mixed families, uh, families in which uh, uh, maybe it's only the son who is a Muslim and the father is not a Muslim. Uh, this is what we call the unstructured dialogue, uh, how they have been able to tolerate each other and also how they have been able uh, to live together despite, despite the fact that half of the family is Muslim and uh, a quarter of the family is non-Muslim or uh, one side of the family is Muslim and the other side is not Muslim. Uh, but they still live together. They've still been able to, to, to celebrate uh, uh, together uh, during Christmas, during Eid. Uh, they mutually respect each other. For a Muslim, okay, he is the one who will be slaughtering in this family of non-Muslims. This is part of the unstructured dialogue. Uh, we also have the structure, structured dialogue. That, you know, uh, you know, Yashir, what you say yes. now is a characteristic of Africa, because it's uh, yes. in Europe. It, it's not. It's very difficult to have in the same family some Muslim, some Christian. But I think that it's uh, 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 an opportunity, a chance that African people shows that uh, fraternity could be uh, even through religions in the same family in the same time. And we don't, we don't know this difference. Absolutely. It's a characteristic that is uh, very common in Africa and people have lived together in that for so long uh, without any conflict or fights. The second one is the structured. We have the interreligious uh, uh, forms of, of dialogue in which most dialogue with the church, which is around. And also we have communities dialoguing with other communities which are around. These are structured. Uh, they normally have chairmen. They normally have uh, people who sit together, time and places uh, that they sit. We've seen the visits of the Muslims to the churches and also of the Christians uh, to the mosque. And sometimes they do occasions together, celebrate together. In terms of Christmas, Muslims sometimes uh, during the Muslim month of Ramadan, they give uh, a charity 
even to Christians, and we've seen Christians giving to Muslims. So these are types of structured dialogues that happen in Kenya. Thank you. Can I, can I add two things here? First yes. of all, apolo apologies. I had to run through half of the university because my connection up there didn't work anymore. So I'm now down with the technical team in our hall. So I'm back uh, here. Uh, second, it is correct that there is a lot of a stronger fabric of interreligious dialogue in many African countries and specifically in a country like Kenya with a long history of um, 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 Muslim Christian relations specifically that is there and Europeans can learn a lot from that we've we've had here in Tangaza we've had a program with uh, German in our case German decision makers uh, and we exposed them to the realities of African interreligious peacemakers and they were astonished of how far how far ahead they are compared to the um, communities in in Europe so this is something definitely where the the um, the global north uh, however you want to define that can learn a lot from the African experience thank you very much for already starting with the questions while I was still indisposed trying to fix my stuff um, so I'm very glad that it's going on like that please continue asking questions to um, our uh, beloved Sheikh uh, here in uh, this webinar Christophe présente-toi parce que je suis pas sûr qu'ils te qu'ils connaissent ils savent que tu es prêtre etc s'il te plaît ok uh, Robert ask me to present myself I will speak after you, Shir. Uh, yes. I'm in France. I'm a priest, Catholic priest, in the Catholic Institute of Marseille, in which we are studying, uh, as in the this uh, in Nairobi, uh, religions, and especially I'm in charge of uh, a department for uh, Christian Islamic studies, and I was a, a student at the Pisa in Rome, and then I live nine years. In, in, in Egypt, one year in Cairo and uh, eight years in Suez. And so uh, I have the opportunity to, to meet uh, people, uh, students in Al Azhar. And you know, in, in Cairo, there are big relationship, strong relationship between uh, the Institute of Dominicans and uh, Al Azhar University. Uh, quite uh, 80% of students going to the library of Dominicans in Cairo are students in uh, Al Azhar University. And in Marseille, we try, and Raphael who is on the picture, was uh, also in Marseille, and he, he spoke uh, on Monday morning about uh, what we try to do on the field of the dialogue in Marseille Uh, there is a group of uh, every two months of imam and priest sharing together. And we had uh, two meetings about uh, Abu Dhabi uh, text. And <laughs> at the beginning, some of our im colleagues, imam, were a bit uh, skeptic, angry. Uh, on the personality of uh, Ahmed Tayeb, Sheikh al Azhar, because they said, why the Pope choose this man? This man was appointed by President Mubarak. But after this introduction and explanation, we were uh, uh, reading the text. And that was the most important. <laughs> Raphael, tu te présentes aussi, comme ça, c'est intéressant de faire réseau. S'il te plaît. Yes, uh, so, sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Sheikh Yusuf Abu Hamza. I was uh, very interested by what you said and uh, uh, the, the historic uh, uh, plan that you, you developed. Uh, I, am, I am a priest of the missionaries of Africa, just as uh, some people, some young people are in, the, in, Tangaza, in Tangaza University. I have been uh, in Algeria for uh, for long, 25 years, uh, among uh, among Muslim mainly because uh, well uh, we, we we were not a lot of Christians, 
and the 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 ambiance was very good uh, altogether. We were friends before being of a religion, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then I went uh, I went to Tunisia. I went to Yemen. And then uh, finally, I, I reached uh, Marseille, where I met uh, Christophe, and we worked together. And I, I was uh, appointed then to Switzerland, where I am now. And I was supposed to go to Brussels to begin something like uh, what we had done in, in Marseille. But, uh, you see, with the, the pandemic, it's uh, quite difficult to, to meet people. I met uh, the, the, the imam of the great mosque of Brussels for, uh, for, an, uh, for uh, discussing with him. But that was all the, my, my encounter up to now. So here I am now uh, listening to you and trying to, to enrich uh, myself of your own experience and I thank you very much for what you have said this morning thank you uh, thank, thank you, you very much sir. thank you I also would like to add uh, one experience that we had with uh, Sheikh Abu Hamza we've had um, when I mentioned the encounter that we had people from Germany in Kenya um, to learn about interreligious dialogue, we had uh, Sheikh Abu Hamza as one of the hosts, and we had the Archbishop of Bamberg, uh, um, um, Bishop Schick, who was hosted by Abu Hamza for four days, um, um, coming to you to a Muslim wedding, I think, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, yes, and to many yes, other yes. tasks that he was uh, conducting. And Archbishop Schick is in charge of the World Church Affairs of the German uh, Bishops' Conference. So th these are the, the the things where people on a high level are learning a lot from the Kenyan experience and bringing it back to Europe hopefully making an impact. We have observed some impact already with uh, some of the MPs that were part of that group, for example, as well. So they have uh, had a couple of mentions of the Kenyan experience in their debates and in their papers. So it is clear that there is demand from, Europe, uh, from the European side. And I'm very happy that Rafael is seeing it in the same way, that the experience that we are having here is an important or provides important lessons to be replicated also uh, in Europe. Um, and it is the um, it is one of the issues where the Europeans can learn a tremendous lot uh, from the African experience. Any further questions in the group? Not a question, but uh, another uh, aspect of experience in the Muslim communities in France. It's difficult and when i was listening to you i think that uh, the, the the dialogue between believers of the same community is difficult for you and for us it's true that in the, in the catholic church in france the majority of people are not uh, uh, willing a strong dialogue with uh, uh, Muslim or Jews or uh, other brothers, and it's the same thing in in uh, in Marseille. It's the biggest town in the world for the Comorian community. You know, Guzu al Kamar, and one of the difficulties inside the Muslim community is that there is uh, very little links between uh, Muslim from root uh, Algerian or Tunisian Arabic and uh, people mm -hmm. coming from uh, Comor Island. So in both communities, the intra-religious di dialogue is a bit difficult. Uh, yes, going by that observation, I think uh, it's one of the problems that I've seen in Europe and uh, that uh, among the Muslims, because uh, mostly in Europe, I visited the, the Muslim community and uh, I, I've uh, I tried to observe uh, how the Muslim community, for example, uh, in German, uh, uh, the Muslim community in German, uh, 
it's very difficult sometimes to 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 bring them to dialogue as intra uh, religious people of the same faith because uh, they're so much inclined towards their roots we have the the the, the Iranian Muslims in German uh, I've seen the the Turkish Muslims in German I've seen uh, the the immigrants those who came from uh, either the former Bosnia the from Bosnia and those who also came from uh, now Syria perhaps uh, or Lebanon they've all kind of uh, lived in sort of uh, uh, of first of all their community uh, more than their religious uh, their religious is an identity but at the same time they've inclined towards community so it has become very difficult also for for the other muslims in german to try and bring the dialogue amongst those people they have uh, I, th- I, th- i think uh, the roots and the origins that just like you are saying in france also the algerians and perhaps uh, the, the the other uh, people from the different roots they've inclined so much into that in such a way that the intra uh, religious dialogue among people uh, is difficult unlike here in kenya where we can uh, dialogue irrespective of uh, whether you are a kikuyu or a jaluo or a, 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 a embu or a meru uh, we dialogue just like uh, uh, muslims or like christians uh, irrespective of uh, which area one comes from thank you I, I, i think there's one parallel though um in in kenya as well where this this um this overlap or or um this overlap of ethnic identity and and religious identity can become problematic in the national discourse. And that is when uh, in Kenya, it, uh, the topic is about the Somali community. So there you have a bit of a similar, a similar issue where the Somalis are, because of their, the social and the cultural situation in a country where they are migrants and, and embattled migrants to some degree, they are becoming much more cohesive. And that is a bit, uh, a, a bit uh, comparable to the European situation where you have these Uh, migrating or um, um, these communities with a migration history um, around the mosques and around the Muslims. So you have different types there. So that that is the only thing where I could say in Kenya you have a similar issue as you have with the Bosnian Muslims, the Turkish Muslims and so on and so on in in Germany or in France, uh, for example. But in general, the structures are and the, the history of of working together is a lot stronger in, in Kenya than it is in uh, France or in Germany for that matter. And I think for us now within the Catholic Church, something like this declaration of uh, human fraternity gives us an anchor point, one more, an additional anchor point, a very recent anchor point um, uh, to say, this is a stable position in which we are. And from this stable position, we can reach out now to the different dialogue partners. In that case, mostly Muslims, but also in, uh, uh, in other aspects. When we're talking about uh, dialogue uh, positions, we are doing trainings here in Tangaza or from Tangaza in uh, different parts of Kenya for priests in the different dioceses to build up the Catholic capacity for dialogue. So we do that with the uh, Bishops' Conference in Kenya. And there, very often the question comes, but why are we the one to reach out? It is because the Catholic Church has the unique position to have these type of documents. Am I frozen? No, it's okay. Um, We have these documents on which we can stable and securely reach out to others. And I think that is a very important point. It might be that we have lost Sheikh Abu Hamza right now. Um, We will try to reconnect him. But in any case, I think we are coming to the close of this session because we will be on a one hour break then because in Kenya it is approaching lunchtime. Um, And we will reconvene then after that for the second webinar today at one o'clock Kenyan time, 11 o'clock European time. Are we all on the same page on that? Oui, ça marche. Okay, it's okay. So much. All right, excellent. Did I, did I excellent. Understood, did I understood? The, did I understand well? It's at 11. Uh, for 11 heures, 11 heures, Raphael. 11 heures. Parce que eux, ils ont leur lunch time. Ah, okay. 
Oh, okay, yes, so exactly. I, was, I, I was going to listen at, at one o'clock. <laughs> so, uh, all right, thank no, you. One o'clock, exactly. So, for clarification, one o'clock Kenyan time, 11 o'clock European time. Okay, thank you. Et tu as le temps de déjeuner en Suisse, Raphaël. Voilà. Oh, C'est l'heure yes. du café, Raphaël. C'est l'heure du café. <laughs> Allez, à, à bientôt. Hey. Excellent. See you thank soon you. again. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Bis bald. Hm.